Hi, I'm the Animal Control Officer, Leslie Badger, and I am here tonight with Dr. Rob Obdansky from the New England Wildlife Center, and he is going to give us a presentation on coyotes. My name is Dr. Robert Adamski. I'm the wildlife veterinarian at New England Wildlife Center. The way I view our mission here tonight is to help reduce or minimize the potential for human wildlife conflict, okay? You guys, the citizenry of Hingham, and all your pets and your livestock and everything have every right to be able to expect to live a nice, peaceful life. And then for ethical and legal reasons, Okay, and just for practical reasons as well, the wildlife also has a right to exist as well. And so the key to that, reducing that conflict, is education and knowledge. So hopefully tonight I'm going to give you some facts, give you the, the ground truth, give you some information that will arm you with enough knowledge that you guys will be able to do that successfully. Okay, the whole point of me being here and everybody else here is that when you guys walk out the door, at the end of the meeting, you guys know more than when you came in. So please ask, okay? That's the whole point of us being here. All right, so we'll get started. Coyotes. All right, some basic facts. As you all might guess, coyotes are related to dogs, okay? They're from the same genus, if you're talking scientific taxonomic terms. And the East Coast coyote is kind of an interesting creature, all right? Based on DNA analysis and genetic research, they've shown that, so the original population, the original range for coyotes was the southwest of the U.S. And then as we extirpated or exterminated all the other large carnivores like cougars, bears, you know, everything else, coyotes filled that void, okay? So they've expanded their range east, all right, and north to the point where they've come into New England. Now, a lot of the coyotes here on the East Coast, you're gonna see compared to the West Coast coyotes are bigger, kind of chunkier looking animals, all right? So the average weight for West Coast coyotes, to give you some kind of clue, is about 14 to 30 pounds. Whereas the ones on the West, uh, sorry, the ones on the West Coast are 14 to 30 pounds, whereas the ones here are 30 to 60, all right? So think like, you know, German Shepherd type, okay? Now, we think that's because they've actually interbred with the gray wolf. So as they migrated east, up through the Great Lakes, uh, Canada and that, and then they came down through New England, uh, they've actually interbred with the gray wolf. That way, that's why our guys tend to be bigger and chunkier, okay? Contrary to popular belief, coyotes are actually not carnivores, okay? They're actually omnivores. They're like dogs, all right? Most of what they eat is you know, animal-based protein, okay? But they do eat fruit, they do eat vegetables, they eat plants, they eat grass, all right? They're act they'll actually eat anything they can get them, get their quote-unquote hands on, all right? They will also scavenge, okay? And that's gonna come into play later. We're gonna talk about trash and some other issues that can help minimize that whole conflict issue, all right? So we talked about their weight. They live alone or in pairs or in small family groups, which is a little bit different than what you see out west. Out west, they tend to form larger packs, and that's based on their, um, the landscape, the ecosystem, as well as their prey base, okay? And this is a little interesting note down here. So they are highly social and adaptable, and adaptable is the key word there, okay? Because that's going to come into play later when we talk about controlling them. Commonly, people bring up the point, hey, why don't we just hunt them, okay? You know, open up the hunting season and we're going to get rid of coyotes, okay? That way we don't have to deal with the problem. That would be interesting. That's an interesting concept. However, 
practically speaking and all the research we have says that won't work. And in fact, in some ways, it can actually make the problem worse, all right? And let me explain why. So first point is that coyotes are not endangered, okay? In fact, we think there's more coyotes now than there have ever been, all right? And that's based on uh, the type of habitats and the ecosystems that we're actually providing for these animals, all right? Now, we have tried, okay, the federal government has tried ever since 1861 when they put out a bounty on them, all right? We've tried to control the population with poisons, guns, traps. The federal government, through the USDA, has the, there's an agency called the Wildlife Service, which uh, will help farmers, ranchers, and other people deal with human wildlife conflicts. They use non-lethal and lethal methods to do that. We have gone to the extreme of using cyanide. They've used aerial hunting with helicopters, okay? And we haven't gotten rid of them, okay? So we've already tried the extreme lethal hunting measures. And based on the research we have, it doesn't work, okay? To tell you, so we've already, they've killed on estimate over 500,000 coyotes, all right, since 1861. A rough estimate for the cost of that to us taxpayers is about $30 million, okay? Now, here's an interesting quote, and this is from a uh, wildlife biologist with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, basically the Utah's version of the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And his quote is pretty interesting. He says, controlling coyote populations through hunting them is like digging a hole in the ocean, all right? And his basic point is, is that it's futile, all right? You, if you just use hunting alone, you will never get rid of coyotes, okay? It's just not practical or scientifically possible. Some of the research has actually shown that lethal control, and what we mean by that is hunting, okay, has actually increased on a local basis coyote populations and also increase the human wildlife conflict. Now you're like, all right, if we're hunting coyotes and we're killing them, how, how is it increasing the population and also increasing the conflict? Well, that's because what they've shown is through studies, coyotes respond to hunting pressure by increasing their litter sizes. So every time they breed, they're going to make more coyotes. And they also increase or actually decrease they start breeding at an earlier age, as young as four to six months old, all right? And that's because of the hunting pressure. That's the way this particular species responds to hunting, all right? Now, even more important, what they found is hunting pressure can actually disrupt the family social groupings of coyotes. Like I said before, coyotes are very social animals. They have a distinct social grouping, and they're territorial. So when you have a formed group with an alpha male and an alpha female, they control their territory, all right? And that can be miles in diameter. They patrol it, they keep all, the, all other coyotes out, and they're the only ones that are breeding in that area, that one pair. But if you go in and through hunting, kill off the alpha male or kill off the alpha female, then you end up creating a situation where you can have stray coyotes come in, everybody starts breeding, okay? And because you'll have broken up that um, social grouping, individual coyotes are now not part of a group, and an individual coyote who doesn't have the backup support from other coyotes is more likely to actually predate upon chickens, livestock, you know, small dogs, stuff like that, okay? So, what you're going to see is, from the research we have, hunting can actually increase the problem. Now, that's not always the case, and in certain circumstances, okay, if you do have a sick or injured coyote, it may be appropriate to actually dispatch that animal, okay? If you have an animal that's displaying, like, neurologic signs, like rabies, whatever, stuff like that, distemper, okay, it may be appropriate and even humane to consider euthanizing or humanely um, shooting that animal, okay? Everything about coyotes isn't awful and tragic, okay? They actually do a lot of good for us. 
So they actually eat a lot of rodents, which causes they get into your house. These are the rodents that get in your house, chew on things, eat things, poop everywhere, and cause you guys headaches, and you got to call exterminators and otherwise cause problems. So by controlling the rodent population, they can actually limit property damage and minimize potential health problems as well. Okay, so there is an upside to having carnivores in general and predators in general and coyotes in particular. Okay, coyotes made for life, they're monogamous. Again, the reason why that's important is, is if you have that stable social grouping, you're going to have a control on their population. But if you go in and disrupt that social grouping, you can potentially have more breeding and then you're going to have more coyotes. Okay. They are devoted parents, okay? We all like that, okay? Now, that plays a role in something we're gonna talk about in a couple minutes as far as that human-wildlife conflict and hazing and potentially dealing with a problematic coyote. Now, so how are coyote populations controlled? So if you can't control them with uh, hunting, how, how are they controlled, okay? Why don't we have a billion coyotes everywhere? Well. It's self-regulated by disease, okay? Some of the common problems you guys will see in both the red fox and the coyote population in, the, in New England, in Massachusetts in, in uh, particular, are what we call scabies or the mange mite, okay? You'll see the coyotes walking around. They're bald. They're all scabby looking. They're really gross, all right? That is a little skin parasite called a mite, okay? It's a, they're sarcoptic uh, mite and that's endemic in the coyote population. And if there's stressful situations, you got, stu uh, you got juveniles, they tend to be the ones that are affected by this disease. So if you have too many coyotes in an area, all right, the juveniles and those animals are the ones that are gonna tend to be affected. Also, periodically, you will have episodes of both distemper, which is a viral disease, all right, as well as rabies go through the populations. And all of those diseases, the parasites, the diseases, everything else, helps control the coyote population at a manageable level for that ecosystem or what it can handle, okay? So there is a natural selection or natural control on the coyote population, even if we don't do anything. Now, to give you guys some kind of clue as to why we're seeing all these human-wildlife potential conflicts, to give you a clue, Massachusetts is the third most highly populated state in the entire country. And we lose about 40 acres of open space on a regular basis, okay, on a daily basis. So what that results in is, is that the remaining open space is often local municipal parks, nonprofit open space, as well as state parks. And it's fragmented. Okay, so therefore the potential interface where people meet wildlife is actually increasing. And that's why worse, you know, it's not that, you know, we have a billion more coyotes in the last couple of years. We do have an increasing number, but it's not like there's a horde of them out there. It's just that humans, okay, are coming into greater conflict or contact with wildlife because of our land management policies and the way we're developing our uh, landscape here in Massachusetts, okay? Now, how do we prevent this whole problem or prevent conflicts, okay? It is possible, don't, don't let anybody tell you it's not possible to coexist with wildlife. You can, you just need to be smart about it and you need to use some common sense, okay? So the first one is, if you guys have pets, keep them on leashes, all right? And and or if you have fenced in areas in your backyard, use them, okay? Now, when I'm talking fences, I'm talking six foot or more, all right? And they need to also be dug underground as well, 18 inches at a minimum, okay? That'll prevent animals from digging underneath, but you need both. You need the height and you need the fence line underground as well. Automatic lighting, okay, that pops on with like motion sensors, okay, often helps, especially at night. And here's the big one, all right? We often shoot ourselves in the foot, all right? Please do not feed the wildlife, okay? Having wildlife and having nature in our backyard is a wonderful thing, okay? But when you feed wildlife, 
you're creating a conflict. You're making that animal dependent upon us, which is A, not good for the animal, because then if that food source disappears, they're, in, they're having problems. But it also sets up that situation where that wild animal, who normally views people as a threat and is not going to try to interfere with us and is going to try to avoid us, now views us as a food source. And instead of avoiding us, they're going to try to come in contact with us more, more frequently. Right? Secure your trash. Make sure you got a lid on it. Okay? Don't leave it out there for days beforehand. That is really important. Like we said before, okay, coyotes are adaptable and they're innovative. Okay, So if they see trash coming out on a regular basis and it's not secured, you just throw the trash bag out there, not in a, con not in a secure container, and it happens on a weekly basis, they're going to catch on to that. And that's a regular food source for them. So why go through the extra effort and the hard work and burning calories of trying to hunt down rodents, which is what you're supposed to do, when you can go eat the easy trash thing out on the curbside every week, all right? So use some basic common sense, and, and the simple act of putting your trash bag in a trash can can help prevent a lot of these conflicts. Same thing is if you go and feed your pets outside, don't leave the food out there, okay? Bring it in at night. All right, if you have, you know, cat bowl, you know, cat food bowls or whatever, bring it in at night, okay? All you're doing is feeding the wildlife, which is not good. So the, those simple acts of just, you know, cleaning up your yard, you know, on a regular basis, throwing your trash bags in a trash can, okay, that can really prevent or minimize a lot of problems, okay? It really can. No solution is ever 100% effective but you can really minimize the amount of problems you have by simple acts like this, okay? All right, something else we're gonna talk about is hazing, and I'm gonna, gonna talk about that momentarily, all right? In general, coyotes, okay, coyotes are not these bloodthirsty monsters that are gonna go attack people and your kids and everything else, okay? Yes, there have been attacks, but it's rare and it's infrequent, okay? The coyote's natural response to a threat, especially people, will be to escape. The exceptions to that are A, if you corner it, okay, if you don't give it an escape route, it's going to have to fight, just like any other animal. B, if it's during the mating season or breeding season, when they have kids, all right, the coyote may defend its den where its uh, kids are. Anybody know uh, what the um, breeding season is for coyotes? So it's usually March through July, okay? They're going to start in March, and they're usually starting to wind up or finish by July. But be aware that during that time season, if you see coyotes out in a specific area again and again, there might be a den nearby, okay? So in that case, just keep that in mind, all right? And I'm not saying don't haze. You know, if they approach you, haze them, but just be aware of that, okay? And always give them an, an escape route. The other thing to keep in mind during that March to July season is that you, because we have heard about this, where you have a couple coyotes following people, okay, or seeming curious, all right? And I'm going to tell you, it's not that they're being aggressive. It's a bunch of dumb juveniles that haven't learned better yet, and mom hasn't gone, hey, don't hang out with the people, okay? People suck, all right? And so they're juveniles, they're young, they don't know any better, okay? So just be aware of that during that March to July season, you may have juvenile coyotes that are acting like teenagers, okay? That's the basic gist of it. But the end point is, if you see a coyote, okay, that is causing a problem, you want to haze it, all right? And what we mean by that is the definition is scaring away a coyote from you, your yard, or your neighborhood, all right? And what that does is the concept behind that is that's going to use the coyote's natural instinct. It's going to reinforce that natural instinct that people are bad, okay? That's their natural instinct. And by you hazing them, it reinforces it. Okay, coyotes are not naturally aggressive towards people. They're not, okay? Now, 
if when do you haze all right you haze if you got a coyote if you have a coyote that's approaching you or your pets or acts in a threatening manner all right and what we mean by hazing is all right you act big bad and loud all right and what we mean by that is yell scream wave your arms take rocks chuck it at them okay you want to be obnoxious as possible all right and be consistent once you start don't stop until that coyote is hightailing it away from you and leaving the area, all right? Because you want to reinforce that point that people are bad. And you need to be consistent about it, okay? So if you see them and they come back again, do it again, okay? Now, the caveat to that is, okay, so we said don't stop, all right? Now, if you think that coyote is sick or injured, okay, it's displaying weird neurologic signs, it's circling, it's falling over, it's drooling, okay, you see weird neurologic stuff, then you need to consider the worst case scenario and that it does have an illness, specifically potentially rabies, okay, it's not always rabies, there, are, there could be other stuff going on, but you need to potentially think that, and in that case, the people you want to call to deal with that animal are your local animal control officers, okay? All right, because they can deal with that animal safely and effectively so you don't get hurt and the animal's dealt with humanely, all right? Now, so that's the basic point for hazing. And like I said, just be aware that during March, and, March through July, you may have the juveniles, and I'm not saying don't haze them, but just be aware of that, okay? And when you do this, always make sure the animal has an escape route, okay, so they can flee, because that's their natural instinct. As you know, I'm Leslie Badger, the animal control officer for the town of Hingham, and I'm gonna go on both sides of the table and introduce everyone. And then um, we will go into discussing our roles and our protocols and how each of us um, in our official capacity deal with coyotes. So. We'll start at this end. I'm Mike Parker. I'm the animal control officer for the town of Wayman. Brian Willard and animal control for Hulko House at Norwell. You met Dr. Rob Adansky. And I'm Pat Huckery, Northeast District Supervisor at the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. <laughs> nice to see you. So we are going to kind of discuss about, as I said, our roles, our protocols of how we handle things. So normally a call will come in and it usually comes to the PD. We see a coyote oh my gosh, you know, it just ran through my yard or it, it chased me and my dog. Then it gets dispatched to myself or the other two ACOs and we will check the area to see if there's a situation with the coyote. For us, our job, our role, our protocol is if it's, we can only deal with it if it's sick or injured. That's the only thing we are allowed to do. We're not allowed to trap it. We cannot just kill it because it's a coyote. Um, and we definitely cannot remove it from the area um, and send it someplace else. So that we are not allowed to do that at all. Um, so we will go out and evaluate the situation. We will see what's going on with the coyote. If it is just a healthy coyote that's in the area, we ourselves will even haze it. We'll speak with uh, the person that called if they're still on scene, discuss the situation, help them, as Dr. Rob um, talked about. Uh, if it's a situation in their yard, myself, um, and I'm sure the <coughs> other two ACUs as well, we'll discuss about the yard, if there was something that could have been a food source that we'll point out if the homeowner didn't realize like, oh yeah, that could have been a food source and why it's showing up. Um, you know, or maybe there might be a den or something like that to secure your yard and, mm -hmm. and to keep it from uh, coming back. So I will let Pat discuss a little bit about if we find we have a further situation uh, about the next step if it would go to fish and wildlife um leslie i have some key points i want to follow up on dr rob's talk which was excellent by the way thank you very much and um there are uh um, a number of issues regarding coyote that are uh fascinating um it's one of my favorite animals uh that i have to deal with on a daily basis and we regularly attend and give talks as well <clears throat> on this topic. And what it boils down to for us at the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife is eliminating food sources, either incidental or intentional food sources, 
and hazing, what we call hazing, some people call it harassment. Because it's very difficult in a city like um, <clears throat> Hingham or Weymouth or who else is represented here? Hingham, Weymouth, and Hull? Cohasset. Cohasset, Hull. thank Hull. you. Um, to hunt or trap a uh, coyote. So we really focus on educating you guys and empowering you to understand what you can do uh, regarding coyote in your backyard, in the schoolyard, on the street, at the bus stop. Um, and then we also like to focus on helping you understand the difference between normal coyote behavior and aggressive coyote behavior. And I have, there's like 20 packets of information back there that I brought. And one of them has this really wonderful table. And we call it the progression of aggressive, aggression in coyotes. And uh, I'm just going to read it out loud to you so you just start um, understanding what is normal behavior, meaning you could do something about it, but you don't necessarily need to call local PD or an ACO. Um, you save them for the really aggressive stuff. And uh, so here's what we consider normal. Frequent use of residential areas. Well, they do that all the time. Normal behavior. Frequent daytime activity. Perfectly normal behavior. Um, uh, many people believe they're active at dawn and dusk or at night, and they are really active all day long. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to emphasize that because we get calls about this all the time. So the Wildlife Center has a hotline, and people call. And thank you very much for calling because we help minimize human wildlife conflicts with that. But one of the big questions they have is that they're like, it's either a raccoon or a coyote. They're like, oh my God, I saw it out during the day. It's got to be rabid. Send the 82nd Airborne Division in and take it out. <laughs> All right. So just know that, especially during that March to July time frame, that might be mom trying to feed a billion kids, okay? Not a billion, okay? But her litter of, of kids. And if she's got a bunch of mouse to feed, she may have to come out. Like, yeah, they are much more active at dawn and dusk but they may have to come out during the day to feed her kids. So if it's otherwise acting normally and not displaying weird behavior or it doesn't look injured, then just be aware that that may be totally normal. And I do want to point out that rabies in coyotes is less than it is in yes. cows. So um, we talk about rabies and coyotes all the time, but they really very rarely, I'm sorry, I need to, that just reminded me to turn my phone off. Um, rarely do contract rabies. Uh, we have 11 cases where a coyote has attacked a human in Massachusetts. Those are, a few of those are rabid animals. Um, the rest were what we consider habituated. And Dr. Rob, you talked a little bit about habituation where coyotes begin to identify their food resources with, from, coming from us. And that can be as simple as you feed your cat on the back deck. Um, there's all those human smells around there, but the cat food is right there, and they'll go for that cat food, but they'll learn not to fear humans, and they'll smell humans as they're eating that cat food. So they'll be like, oh, humans gave me that cat food to eat. So that's just how they, you know, that's just how they're going to become. They're very adaptable, and that they learn where the food is and that you feed them food. Um, one of the most common ways... Oh, I have to get back to this. No, that's but fine. anyway, one of the most common ways that um, coyotes end up in your backyard is because you're either feeding birds, and we love to feed birds, or your neighbors are feeding birds. And there was a case that I went to in, uh, I think it was uh, Gloucester, where uh, this one neighbor, they kept their, they kept their yard completely clean. Uh, they did have a bird feeder, but cleaned up around it every single day. And the reason a bird feeder is, um, in the wintertime, for coyotes or at any time, for a lot of other different wildlife species, is not necessarily a good idea, is that uh, the seed falls out of the bird feeder onto the ground, and then small mammals come out, mice, voles, chipmunks, squirrels. Well, those are great food for coyotes. And so they end up coming after the small <laughs> mammals that are attracted to the dropped bird seed, which brings them really close to your house and close to where you might be walking your dog or you're outside. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to harm you, but it brings them closer into you and into your neighbor's yards, which sometimes neighbors don't really appreciate that. <clears throat> We had okay. a, before, I don't mean to interrupt you. We did yes. have, I know some people are probably saying, what, feed coyotes? I, I did have a call. Uh, it was a very nice 
elderly resident. Um, the neighbor actually called and said, I'm a little concerned. I think she might be feeding the coyote that comes through our neighborhood. So I went over to chat with her and sure enough, she said, oh yeah, it's my friend It stops through the yard every day. Lo and behold, she'd wait for her Meals on Wheels to show up. She'd heat it up, kid you not, heat it up. And she'd go out on the deck and she'd wait for the coyote to come through. And she'd eat a little bit and she'd throw it out to the coyote. She did not realize that she was creating a habit for that coyote. So talking with her family and talking with her, we got that to stop. So it does happen. You may not realize it, and you may be on the other end of it where you're like, why is this coyote? I'm keeping everything so clean. But you may have, could be an elderly, it could be someone that has a dog, they're leaving out the bones. So let the dog eat the, the bones out on the lawn, they don't pick them up regularly. So um, it could be a situation like that. So it is important in your neighborhoods to make sure talking with your neighbors. A lot of people now have their um, email groups or, or neighborhood Facebook pages to talk to each other and, and really discuss, say, hey, you know, I went to this meeting and something's really important. If we want to keep these coyotes away and other wildlife, really let's all get together and make sure we're doing these steps to make sure. Because if one of us is allowing this to happen, it's going to continue to allow these coyotes to come in because they know they're going to get some kind of food source here. It's that whole overarching concept of keeping wildlife wild. Okay, right. wildlife's amazing. I'm a wildlife veterinarian. I love wildlife, but they should be wild. Okay, they're not our domestic pets. They're not livestock, and there's a difference there. And okay. unless it's a uh, <clears throat> mouse on roller skates, I can promise you a coyote will never, ever, ever need Meals on Wheels. I promise <laughs> you that. The, the bird feeder is a big issue. I've had quite a few of them in Weymouth. People just don't realize what they're doing. I do have a. I'm just going to go through the. I, I just got diverted to something else. Anyway, back to the progression of aggression of coyotes. So um, number three on here is um, a behavior that does not constitute a threat to public safety is nighttime attacks on unsupervised pets. So that's somewhat bold but really perfectly normal for a coyote. Uh, following that is a daytime attack on an unsupervised pet. That's a little bit more bold but uh, we're responsible for our pets. Um, coyotes just passing through, maybe going from bird feeder to bird feeder, and happens to see a small dog. That happens, it's not considered uh, aggressive behavior. Now we get into the three behaviors that do constitute a threat to public safety. When a coyote attacks a leashed pet, when the human is present, the human's holding on to the leash. The leash is one of those short leashes, not one of those ones where they go, they zing out and they go 50 feet out into the woods or somewhere. That's enough distance where a coyote might feel brazen enough to come. But if it really is, uh, if it attacks on a short leash, and it's not attacking the human, just so you know, they're attacking the dog because they're very territorial and uh, either they're territorial or they feel like that's food for them. And so that you could definitely let your ACO know about that that coy a coyote is doing that because oh animal, animal control, control officer. officer these these wonderful people to my <laughs> life <laughs> <laughs> they might want it they might they'll want to know that that's important to know a uh, short leash held by the human not just run the dog running ahead with the leash on the ground and they come up and very close and try to attack the dog or do attack the dog. And then there's, here's another behavior that constitutes a threat to public safety. When a coyote approaches or closely follows people and that doesn't flee when it's hazed. And Dr. Rob talked a lot about hazing and hazing is so easy for you to do and we really are empowering them to do that. And um, you know, for me, uh, I do, so I have chickens and we have sheep that have lambs, and we have dogs, and a lot of other things. So anyway, coyotes come around my house frequently, but we never have a problem with them. And there's a number of reasons is, and, and, uh, for that, and it's we do a lot of hazing. And one of my favorites is a pot and a pan. Boom, 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 boom. And what I will tell you, you, you can't be inside your house behind the door looking through the window and going bang, 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 go away coyote. <laughs> so the coyote needs to know that you're looking at them and you're uncomfortable with them and you go outside your door and you go bang, 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 bang and you keep walking forward until it goes, oh, she means me. 
And then it goes off, and then it knows that you meant it. And um, one of the things we tell kids is that, I mean, kids at bus stops sometimes will see a coyote come right down the street. They can just take their coat and pop it over their head, make themselves look really big, yell at the coyote. Coyote moves along. When I'm walking in the woods, I am very quiet because I'm trying to see wildlife, but I often don't see wildlife because it sees me way before and hears me way before I see it. Or and so what I do is I take a walking stick. And um, I, one time I had a coyote that was, it was very interested in me. It was following me. They follow you. They're curious about you. They don't necessarily want to bother you. They're just like, they're curious about us, and they'll follow us. And then you'll turn and go, go away, coyote. And it'll walk a few steps on, on the woodland trail, and then it'll turn around, and it'll look at you. And you'd be like, oh, it's looking at me. So it's just curious. It doesn't mean anything. And so what I also, so I carry a walking stick. And I behave like a, um, you watch animal shows. If you're, in, if you're here, you watch animal shows, probably. And I take my stick and I behave like a silverback gorilla. And I wrap my stick in the bushes and I shake the bushes like that. And and it's gone. That coyote is gone. So that's if you're out in the woods walking by yourself or the kids at the bus stop or if it's in your backyard. That's just a few things that you could do. You can also go on our website, nestwildlife.org. We have a Living with Coyote fact sheet that's on there. It's also 20 over there on the, on the table. It's fantastic. It, it, absolutely. It's really great, and it's just got the basics on it. So you can go get that. Okay, I have one more <laughs> progression of aggression behavior. And then I'll stop talking for a little bit. Um, the last one is the coyote physically attacks a person. That's extremely aggressive. That obviously should be reported to your animal control officers or your local PD. Um, there, there's one other organization that, um, one of, there's an agency that you should also know that you can call. Uh, local PD usually can get there fast. Uh, ACOs are probably the first uh, line of defense, but there's also uh, the Massachusetts Environmental Police, and we were going to have an officer here tonight, but they're also available to help in the cases of the coyotes that are considered aggressive. So those last three I talked about, attack on a leashed pet with a human present, approach follows people really closely, does not flee when harassed or hazed, and physically attacks people, those are the ones that you absolutely should pick up the phone and call your local PD about. Um, the rest are fairly normal behavior, and what I'm saying is that you're going you're gonna to walk away from here and be empowered and haze the coyotes yourself. Um, I'm going to give them another one, a couple no, more hazing right. things. Okay, so the other thing is, like if this is an empty bottle, you can put pennies in this and squeeze it. It makes a ton of noise. Um, you could do it with a Coke Co can. Coffee can. Coffee can, thank you. Just make a lot of noise and vary it. If a coyote continues to come to your yard, just, you know, vary it. I throw rocks. I throw rocks. I'm not necessarily throwing the rocks at the coyotes. I'm throwing them. I throw them into the trees where the coyotes are howling right behind my sheep pens. And what happens is they ricochet off the trees and they make a whole bunch of noise and the coyotes go away. Another very good thing is, a, is an air horn. Air horn. Um, I carry one Whistles. in my truck. I use it all the time. So they, it works excellent. Another thing I have when I go hiking, um, I have a small foldable, it's like, it's literally this big, umbrella. And it's for multi-purpose, not just for if it's raining. If for some reason I can't get that animal, whether it's a coyote or any other wildlife, because I like to go deep in the woods with my dog, um, if I can't get it, I know that I have that tied to my backpack. I can pull that out, and it has the button, so I just, the, the little strap that straps, like, the material apart, and, and then it, it pops open quick, and that usually sends them. And then if it doesn't, like she said, with bushes, start hitting it on the bushes, things like that, they're gone. It's not an issue. So that's something else that you could have. They're very lightweight. You could, you know, just hook it on your, put it, they usually have a wrist strap that you can put around your wrist. You can hook it to something, like you can use a carabiner, hook it to your belt. Um, that's something else. Um, also for your yard, you could have in the warmer months a hose ready. That's something I always have readily available or I tell people because that's something usually everyone has. Have that ready to go. You can start spraying it because they're not going to want to be sprayed with a hose. And that usually gets them going pretty quickly too out of the yard, especially if you see them sunning themselves in the sun. And they actually have motion detector sprinklers now. 
um, which I found out by accident. Um, <laughs> the, uh, somebody was trying to keep deer away from their garden. I started to approach. I got drenched, thinking somebody's playing games with me, and I realized what it was. So, you know, they, they, there's a lot of different things out there that you can do. So, I have just a few more tips to residents, and then maybe they have questions for yep. us. I'm yep. working less. Um, I just want a couple more things. I know we talked about securing your garbage, and that cannot be more, I'm just going to emphasize that, because uh, it really solved a lot of problems with coyotes in the town of Belmont. They had an animal control officer who worked closely, and they that was their problem. They were putting out their trash in the plastic bags, and they could smell the chicken bones or the um, leftover, I don't know, Chinese food or whatever that was in those bags, and they would just open those bags and eat it. And I will say that coyote numbers, the density of coyotes in cities and towns like this is uh, a family group um, probably uh, in six square miles. How many square miles is Hingham? 22. Thank okay, you, well, you can't really fit that many. So you can't really fit that many coyotes in, in Hingham. However, you can fit more in Hingham if you feed them more. And of females, the alpha female, can have anywhere from one pup to nine pups. And that really is dependent on how much food is available and the other components of her habitat. But mostly it's very food driven. So which is why we're focusing on having you guys put food away and don't incidentally feed them. Um, we already talked about bird feeder areas. There's, oh, crawl spaces. So there must be a ton of crawl spaces for them to go in and find, um, you know, maybe den under buildings or sheds or, or um, porches that aren't used that often. So those areas can all be just closed off. You just haze them away. I had some fox under my back shed, and I just waited until they were all out, and then I just put a... Um, I put hardware cloth and I dig it and I put it into the ground six inches and I turn it under so they can't dig and come back in. So you have to close off your crawl spaces and um, you can also cut back your brushy edges in your yard. Like if, uh, you know, just cover for them. They'll get, they can come closer if they have a bunch of big rhododendrons in the backyard that they can just get closer to your house. Just um, yes. And then I wanted to t attend to the chicken. Yes. Cause Chickens. That's you have to be fastidious. Easy. You have to be very fastidious with your uh, handling of your feed and whether you decide to have a run or not. If you decide not to have a run and they are free-range chickens, then they are free-range chickens for the coyotes as well. So what you have to do is you can have a run. You can let them out during the day, but as it gets close to um, nighttime, just let them you go, get them back in, close the door. That's how we lost like 30 chickens one night from a coyote. And we were out playing Monopoly, and we didn't get back till 9 o'clock at night, and that coyote, had just they just come in and taken 30 chickens out because we were free-ranging, and we didn't close the door. And so um, there's also, I mean, sometimes people put up fencing, um, you know, in their yards if they have dogs and they want to be able to just open the door and let the dogs out to the backyard without going with them. That's perfectly fine. Uh, Dr. Rob, you said six feet. Six feet is good. Um, and um, into the ground by six inches is good, uh, but we do know that coyotes can figure out how to go up and over a six-foot fence, so some have done that before, so people can run, people will run like a little uh, hot wire, wire along there. the top, um, you know, with a solar charger. <coughs> if you really want to have a secure area in your backyard, that's great. Uh, mostly coyotes are not gonna, they're not gonna spend too much energy and time trying to get through that fence to get to the other side because they want to get an easy meal that doesn't hurt them and doesn't cause injuries to them. Also, um, another big thing we have in Hingham is the electric fences. So um, your pet has the collar around their neck and they're secure in the yard, but the problem is, is you're keeping the animal, your, your pet, in the yard while the coyote has free range to come in, corner that animal because the animal d knows it doesn't want to be electrocuted running away from it out of the yard. So even though, yes, they could be great to keep your animal in, they are not going to protect them from coyotes. And it's only unfortunately going to make it worse because the, the dog is going to be scared to want to keep continuing to flee that coyote and it's going to stop in its tracks. Um, and that's going to unfortunately give the coyote the opportunity to go after it. So 
I would think twice about the electric fences or if they're going to be let out to go out on the electric fence, someone supervised. That would be the most important thing. Oh, let me be specific. It was an electric line along the top of the fence that, like, a, it's a hot wire on the top of the fence, not one of those collared dog things. The other thing you can do with a fence is if you have a, you run a piece of cable between the sections, but you put a piece of, like, PVC pipe over the cable, so whenever anything goes to put its paws on the top, it just spins and they can't get enough to get over. Also, We'll do questions in one minute. Um, another thing is with, with sheds, you always want to check all the way around. Anything that you can you yourself can access all the way around or is mm -hmm. enough that you can stick your head in and look is enough that they could squeeze their body in and, and start making a den underneath. I had someone recently call and they said, I noticed this coyote keeps coming out, laying um, in our backyard, sunning itself, gets up later in the day and heads behind the shed, but I can't figure out where it's going. And I said, have you looked behind the shed yet? No, I'm a little nervous. So I said, all right, I'll come out and take a look. I went out, took a look, looked behind it. Sure enough, there was just a big enough hole that it could go underneath. There was plenty of room underneath. So even if you think the front looks all secure, check around the back or, or the side that you may not go to a lot that's kind of off by like a, a fence or side of the house. Check in between there to make sure it's not scurrying in there or any other wildlife is scurrying in there and making a nice den because they really like to use the sheds, porches, uh, decks, anything that they can get under and feel secure there, um, they'll try and get under there and, and make a den if they can. Um, While she's talking about denning and animals taking up space under your deck, your crawl space or whatever, not only coyotes but any kind of wildlife, we get a bazillion calls all week long that there's a skunk living under my shed, there's a this. We have no authority to trap that animal and move it. Right. None whatsoever. People think that we're supposed to come out and trap it and get it out of there. We have zero authority under the law to do that. So obviously Sergeant Gamash from the Environmental Police was not able to be with us tonight. He would have spoke a little bit about, so as we said, when they progress to the behavior of if someone, a human got attacked, um, where we, that's where he would come in, we would speak with him and we would, we would go out and search for that animal um, to be able to get it, test it, uh, make sure it doesn't have any diseases like rabies um, and that's where we would get the permission from him to to do that and he he himself or um, anyone from the environmental police would come out and assist us in that and uh, Officer Parker can tell you about an incident in Weymouth because I know that's always been a hot topic as well um, that happened with a child in Weymouth so it, we that's had, what, one of the reasons that was I probably I don't know five six years ago up off of Pond Street in South Wayne, but there was a two-year-old child bitten in the head by a coyote. Um, the grandmother was pushing a carriage with the kid walking next to her. There was some food in the carriage. Supposedly, the only information we have, the only witness is the grandmother. Coyote kind of came from out of nowhere and ended up taking a hunk out of the, the kid's head. Um, but that, Mass Wildlife can attest to it, it's very, very rare for something like that to happen. They just, they really don't want anything to do with you just as much as you don't want anything to do with them. And the only other one I had was we had a, um, this was last year in North Weymouth. We had an individual that tied his cat out on a run, like you'd tie a dog out on a run around the backyard. He looked out, the coyote had the cat in its mouth. It pulled the cat off the runner, took off to the neighbor's yard. He ran after it. Coyote did drop the cat. Now the cat's all bloody. He picked the cat up, ran back to his house. Coyote came after him and chased him up on his deck, and he closed the door before the coyote got in the house. I got there. The coyote was definitely had some. wasn't acting right. He actually ended up coming around the corner of a house and approaching me. And I euthanized him, and then he went to the wildlife center. But he tested negative for it. Yeah. Just so you guys know, like, you know, everybody's been saying, the top three rabies vector species here in Massachusetts, number one is raccoons, two is striped skunks, and by far they're the most common, and then a distant third is all the different bat species, okay? And then everything else. Like, there are other animals that have tested positive, but they're pretty far down on the list as far as numbers and incidents and all that, so. But there are other diseases that can make 
coyotes act abnormally, like distemper and some other diseases. So there's been documented cases of coyotes uh, swimming out at least to the uh, islands in like Boston Harbor and stuff like that. So so they can actually swim pretty well. I don't know an exact distance, but they actually can swim pretty well. They haven't made it to Martha's Vineyard or yeah. Nantucket yet. No, they're pretty, yeah, that's pretty far. They did, it was, I forget what island it was. I actually went out, it was an island in Boston off of um, like Moon Island area. The EPOs had one lone coyote on that island. So we set up, a, I have a large trap that we set up out there. It never went in the trap. They're very smart. They are not easy to catch. Yeah. It's not like trying to catch a skunk. Yeah. So, yeah. so do you suppose this coyote got up one morning and said, He went for a swim. Right back, I'm going for a swim. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's the only way he got over there. I couldn't even see it from where he right. was. But there was only one over there. Yeah. But to answer your question, yes, they can definitely swim. An adult deer, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, that, that would be unusual. Normally, because you, you, you have to remember, with, if, you're, if you're a predator, you want to take out something that's not going to fight back, okay? Most of the time, with the size predators we have here in Massachusetts, they're going to go after the fawns, the juveniles, okay? I'm not aware of any case. I don't know if you are. They will from time to time. You know, when we have really heavy snow, um, Worcester County West, really deep snow, and the, the, the deer break through, the coyote can go on top. They can wear a deer out that way. But it really isn't. Uh, they're not managing the deer herd for us. And um, they're really not harvesting that many, um, or taking that many fawns either. Because um, at the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, we, we've been tracking the deer harvest for literally 35, 40 years. And what that means is that we gather information on their age, their sex, the antler beam diameter, um, and we age them with their, with their teeth. So we've been collecting that information. All that tells you is uh, the health of your deer herd and it helps us figure out how to manage the deer herd. And so one of the ages that we, um, met, that we measure is one and a half year old. So that's, you know, the fawn grows up, gets to be a little older, and what we would see if the fawns were actually being taken by coyotes at high numbers, our one and a half year old uh, data set would go down, but it doesn't. It stays steady state. So they they are taking some fawns, but not in a tremendous uh, the, number. The vast majority of predation that coyotes do is on rodents. I don't know what the jaw strength is, but my, my uh, I, I would say it's closer to a dog than a wolf, ex exactly. And I will, I, well, there's a point I wanted to make about the size of a coyote. So in the wintertime, coyotes, we get reports that coyotes are enormous, that it's a wolf. And so, um, there is this transition that happens from summer to winter, and a 40-pound is coyote is a is an average-sized coyote. In the winter time, they can really look big because they grow a lot of <laughs> under fur and they get really poofy, so they can look much bigger and look more like a wolf size. Um, a really big coyote is is 60 pounds. That's a rare one. Anyway. Commun they're communicating. Um, so the peak of coyote breeding is mid-February. So they still would be breeding right now, towards the end of February now. So the, uh, the alpha male and alpha female will be communicating with each other, and that's so how they find each other. I mean, it could be, it could be more family. It sounds like there's a dozen. <laughs> all together. Um, this time of year, it's probably not a dozen together. It's probably a few, it's like two animals. Um, once she has the pups and they start and they come out of the den and she begins the 
training of the pups, well, that's when they teach the pups how to communicate because that's when it can sound like you have a dozen animals in your backyard. So late, you know, summer into fall, and then there's a dispersal that happens with the young ones. There's a lot of communication that's going on. And right now it's probably just two. And they can make a ruckus. Yeah. So just one more. You said there's a family every six square miles. Square, six, six, six square miles in cities. Yes. In in like urban the areas. Of that would be like it. Yeah. Yes. Because like we give them so much food. They need less of an area in Weymouth than they do <coughs> way out in Western Mass because there's no trash cans or anything else. They or actually bird have to. Right. They actually have to go hunt for their food. So their territory then expands and they protect it from other coyotes and they have their own territory. But when you put them in Weymouth with the trash, the bird feeders, all the dumpsters and people just leaving feed and stuff, <laughs> they don't need a huge area to survive because they have a huge food source in a small area. You can fit more in into a city because there's a lot of food available, which is why we always talk to you guys about putting your food away. But I wanted to just come back to her. and She was saying, you know, you, lots of coyote activity. Does that mean like coyotes running through your yards? And I mostly hear them and not okay. see them, but I hear them okay. probably three or four times a week. I mean, that's not necessarily threatening behavior if you just hear them. I mean, they're doing what coyotes do, which is social bonding and communication and stuff like that. A person is not a threat to their territory like a dog because they they have the same genetic makeup as a dog. They don't have the same genetic makeup as a human. And a human is going to react differently than a dog. A dog is the, going to approach that coyote. The, a, human a human's going to stop. Well, a kid could, well, but. well, right. The thing is, you were saying like do the hazing. Well, a little kid is going to run. So what happens if they run versus doing the hazing thing? That's part of the thing is you can never tell what a wild. You can't tell what a domestic run, dog is going to do, chased, yeah. to be honest with you. They're animals. Well, I would add that part of that is also just talking to your children and your grandchildren. And, um, you know, if they encounter a coyote, they can try the hazing, but then they just, just tell them to back away and go find an adult. And uh, just back away. I, and I'll have to tell you, I, that's easier said than done, because every time I encounter a coyote, my hair stands on the top of my arm, and I'm a wildlife biologist. So, and if, but, yeah, but you, you're supposed to you tell them not to run, just walk away, back away. And I would gauge, if you're talking to your kids or your grandkids about wild animals and not to touch them, I would gauge on, because people say, well, you know, I want them to go out and play in the yard. If you're talking to your grandkids and you're noticing they're not really understanding it yet, that's probably the age where you're saying, okay, I still need to supervise them out in the yard versus, okay, my, my 10-year-old un completely understands that I, and knows how to haze, knows to stop when they see the animals start to slowly back away, make noises, call for the adult and do those. Okay, they can play out in the yard. They know what to do immediately versus, you know, you're talking to a three-year-old. They're not going to understand that. They're, yes, their immediate thought is to run or, you know, oh, it's a puppy. The, if they don't get that concept, my, my whole thing on that is then they definitely, no matter what, need to be supervised if they're outside. The thing about hunting around here is the thing you need to realize too, there's very few places you can actually hunt. Like in the town of Weymouth, I can show you on a map where you can actually, and you're going to be within a 15 foot area or you're in violation of the law. Because you have to be within 500 feet of a dwelling and 150 feet of a roadway. If, if the, the thing, I mean we're kind of getting off topic here with, with, with hunting stuff, but if, if you read the definition of hunt, under the 131 laws, which is all the hunting laws and things like that. It's not that you have to have a rifle and you have to shoot at it. There's a very broad, it's a very broad definition in there that you can be charged with hunting out of season, hunting within 500 feet of a dwelling. Never mind if you discharge a firearm. Okay, so I also want to offer um, if you, you know, anytime you have a question, as we go forward, feel free to give a call to my office. You're more than welcome to do that.